Now, Makati City is the Philippines' business powerhouse and home to over 600,000 residents. Leading the charge in carbon reduction, renewable energy and green job creation is Mayor Abigail Binet, also a key member of COP28's advisory committee. Well, she spoke to us earlier from the summit in Dubai and uh, shared how cities and local governments are crucial in the fight against climate change. There is a recognition coming from uh, from the presidency of COP28 that local governments now play a very vital role uh, in the in the fight against climate change. So this COP is is very different from the previous COPs because uh, we just had the first local climate action summit. This is the very first one since since time and memorial. So uh, we're not just talking about. Um, members from the national level, but uh, a delegation of mayors are here in COP to, to show you that for us to be able to achieve our targets, local governments are the key to, to be able to achieve all our commitments during the, the Paris Agreement. Well, Mayor, you are, as you've mentioned, you know, fortunate to be on the advisory committee for COP28. But what about the smaller countries, though? I mean, is there a sense that, you know, they have to, they have to jostle if they don't have, you know, that seat uh, in the committee in, in order to be heard? So, uh, again, th there goes the local action plan. If you have a local action plan, and we will be able to provide technical assistance for your projects to be bankable because at the end of the day, even if you have a plan, if you don't have funding, then it's just a plan. So that's also the reason why we're asking for uh, local governments to have direct access to funding and not having to parse it from to the national government. There are times politics comes in where you're not politically aligned with the national government, uh, then you don't get any funding, or there are a lot of times where the ambitions, the climate ambitions are higher on a local level than a national level. So um, what we're pushing for COP, in COP28 is to be able to have direct access to finance it. And Maya, on a regional note, I mean, com coming from the Philippines, what are just some of the key issues that ASEAN collectively, they're zeroing in on? Well, of course, we, we are pushing that funding should be focused on the global south, especially uh, the Philippines and countries in the Southeast Asia are the most vulnerable in terms of disaster, and we have the highest risk uh, exposure in terms of uh, climate change. So we are asking that um, funding be given to the most vulnerable, especially in the, the newly established loss and damage fund, that the, that fund be readily available to uh, Southeast Asian countries that are constantly being uh, exposed to uh, global warming and uh, natural disasters. And speaking of funds, you know, the success of COP28, it does hinge on climate uh, finance. Uh, firstly, you know, Mayor, is there enough money to go around? And I guess the bigger question is, you know, who should be footing the bill? Who should be receiving it? I mean, distributing the funds effectively seems like a difficult thing to uh, agree on among the negotiators, isn't it? Well, the the number one polluter should be the one that should be footing the bill. Uh, uh, the developing, the, the developed countries are the one that should be footing the bill to, to be able to level, to level off. You can't expect developing countries to pitch in money when their concern is food security, uh, livelihood, jobs. Um, so I'm just hoping that their pledges, their commitments, they really put their money where their mouth is. And, and, and May, I, I suppose there is also a climate uh, paradox for your countries. I mean, the Philippines has low per capita emissions in Asia, and yet it remains highly vulnerable to extreme weather. So how do you make the case to wealthier nations? Or, or like what you said, the number one polluter should be footing the bill. How do you make that case uh, that, that support is crucial in, in mitigating the impact of events like flooding and typhoons? Well, I think there's a really close collaboration between the the MDBs. For us to be able to get accessing access to financing, we have to be close and have a very good uh, relationship with multilateral, multilateral development banks, the ADBs, World Bank, AIB, AIIB. Um, and I think what we also need to prove on a local level is 
uh, when they fund local projects, it actually works uh, because we have to show them that you've done this here in the city and it can be replicated in another city because, you know, sometimes MDBs don't like dealing with cities because we're just too many as compared to just dealing on a national level. So we're hoping that uh, COP28 levels that in any COP, um, the most vulnerable countries, the developing countries are given a voice to appeal to those that are uh, that have the money and they're the ones that should foot the bill. All right. And uh, just before I let you go, Maya, um, what is a successful outcome uh, from COP28 from your perspective? Well, number one is uh, the, the uh, endorsed CHAMP, which is the essentially for cities to get uh, access to funding. Uh, number two is the recognition of the role of local governments to fight uh, climate change. Very controversial as to the fossil fuel phase out. I think that's something that's beyond my beyond my my um, control. But at the end of the day, it's better than not talking. The fact that nations, uh, people from the oil companies, are here and talking is a first step, rather than just being on a hard on a hard position and hard line and not talk. So that in itself for COP28 is an achievement.